I think the biggest challenge was to convince the world that this project is worth making. Because it took seven years to make, half of the time was making the film and half of the time was making the film happen. film about legendary American choreographer Merce Cunningham. He, uh, it, this year is his hundredth, would have been his hundredth anniversary. He was born in 1919 and he died in 2009. So the film is about 30, his 30 years, his first 30 years in New York City between 1942 and 1972. Uh, this was the years when Mars basically had nothing, no support, no audience, no press. Um, but what he had was his friends, who happened to be big artists also, composer John Cage and the visual artist Robert Rauschenberg, as well as the dancers. And the film is really about how he how Mars became Mars from a young from a young dancer to an established choreographer. What do you do during rehearsal? How does this all happen? We rehearse a piece, and then I will keep track by a stopwatch of a given section. One of the pieces that we used to do was Sweet for Five, and we could go several months without rehearsing that dance and then do it, and we would come out within, oh, at the most 10 seconds difference. I must confess I never wanted to make a film about Mars Cunningham because he's a kind of choreographer who has 16 dances going to different directions and you cannot frame a single shot. So he really works with space and uh, so I never imagined making a film about him. Uh, but when Wim Wenders made his film Pina about German choreographer Pina Bausch in 3D and I watched it and I was particularly inspired by this one sequence of Rite of Spring in this film, where you could feel really close to the dancers, as though you were stepping inside the dance. And I felt like 3D and dance have incredible potential. This coincided with uh, the closure of the Merskaheim Dance Company. It's ironic that Pina Bausch and Merskaheim died two weeks apart in 2009. Um, but, you know, Pina. Bausch Company continued, but Merskaihem Dance Company closed on December 31st, 2011. And I remember very clearly sitting at the last performances of the company at the Brooklyn Academy of Music in New York and looking at all those 14 people and going to different directions and thinking perhaps 3D and Merce can be a good fit. Primarily because 3D works with space so well and Merce, Merce works with space so well. I think the best 3D film will be the one that will have no cuts. You know, something like Russian Ark, shot in St. Petersburg and Hermitage by Sakurov. That would be really good in 3D because it's really about sort of uh, helping people to experience bodies and space and spaces without interruption. That's what 3D is really good at. Mm. 
So the idea was not to capture Marcel's dances, but to try to translate his ideas into cinema with capital C. So to create an experience about his work and then find out who he was through his work. Yeah. Oftentimes documentaries about artists are biographical. So you learn a lot where they come from, what they studied, what they did, but you know very little what the work was like. So my idea was to basically create an experience for the audience through the artist's work, you know, to create an experience about the artist through his work. It seemed to me that in the society around us, there were so many scientific possibilities coming up that one did not have to think in terms of one thing following another, but say in a field. And I began to make dances with those possibilities in mind. So to speak, compositional method was by using chance or random means. Wirf. Drei Münzen für die Dauer. Drei Münzen für auf oder hinter der Bühne. Eine Münze für Stillstand oder Bewegung. If I don't like what comes up with the chance procedures, do I then throw it away? In other words, do I let my taste uh, enter this thing? And I uh, don't. I try it out. I had an incredible uh, privilege working with two people, Robert Swinston, who worked with MERS for 32 years, and Jennifer Goggins, who worked with MERS for 12 years. And they were my directors of choreography. And together we went through uh, about 80 works that MERS created between 1942 and 72. We picked 14 pieces. Most of them were iconic pieces in collaborations with Robert Rauschenberg. Then behind each piece, we identified sort of key questions, you know, concepts that MERS was exploring. You know, MERS never started with a narrative idea or a music piece or, you know, emotion. He always started with a physical question or concept. So if it's a dance based on the um, action of falling, for instance, like Winter Branch, we would think, okay, well, how would cinema think about falling? And of course, you know, you think about heights, you think about Hitchcock, you think about vertigo. Vertigo, a feeling of dizziness, a swimming in the head. Figuratively, a state in which all things seem to be engulfed in a whirlpool of terror as created by Alfred Hitchcock in the story that gives new meaning to the word suspense. You know, you start to engage his idea with cinema language, you know. So in that case, we put on the rooftop, yeah, and um, because it was, for me, you know, cinema doesn't, in the cinema you don't have to fall, you, you know, it's all about making illusions, yeah. You can feel the danger of falling. In Winter Branch, the general idea was darkness. It was all about violence. I'm interested to hear you say it was about violence, because I think on the whole you don't like these interpretations. You see, this piece, by the combination of the elements, produces this violent display. But the kind of violence it produces is special to each spectator. One was race riots, and one was atomic bomb, and one was concentration camps, and on and on. That's how we went about working with those pieces. If it's a dance based on the idea or concept of layering, then, like Rune from 1959, we'll put it into the woods, you know, where you can actually experience, you know, there's so many more layers and dances become part of an image, you know, of an environment. If it's a dance based on the concept of being close together, uh, physically, like almost tied by a rubber band, Okay, we'll think, okay, what, this, is, this has to do with confinement. How would confinement be treated by cinema? Um, now, it's interesting because we can't quite confine the dancers because they need to space to dance. But what we can do, we can use light to sort of tie them together. So that's how we went about sort of working with Mercer's ideas in cinema and basically creating concepts for each piece. So we almost have 14 different you know, movies in one film. In 
in terms of technical uh, aspects of the production, um, I was lucky to work with uh, an amazing stereographer, uh, Josephine de Rob. Um, her father, Alan de Rob, invented stereoscopic 3D and worked with the inventors. Uh, and then when he died, Josephine continued working with them uh, on all his 3D films after Pina. Um, so we had two cameras, uh, Ariflex Mini and Screenplane Rig. Um, it was only one setup. We didn't have multiple uh, setups. It was always one. And the idea was to sort of choreograph you as I. So the principle was one movement phrase, one shot, you know, one idea. So pretty much every movement phrase was shot in, the, in, in a single shot. In 2015, we got to shoot a pilot, um, which was one of the dances. Uh, it's called Summer Space, um, with the pointless Russian brick decor. We shot it in France, and that's where the first time Josephine really got involved. Um, and this was very interesting because, you know, she was our kind of 3D expert in a sense of what to do and what not to do. Now, I've had a background uh, of an editor for 15 years. So for me, I was very interested in how is it different to edit in 3D versus 2D. And with help of Josephine, especially like in 2015, I could, we could just understand certain things. You know, like for instance, you can't quite cut from a um, you know, wide shot to close up because what happens is uh, you disorient your viewer he doesn't know, she doesn't know where they're in space. And uh, it's a disruption. As I told you, I think the best film would not have any cuts in 3D. So um, if you would like, what we discovered with Josephine is that if you would like to create a close-up, you actually have to start with a wide shot and physically come closer. You know, so you don't cut to close-up, you come to close-up. And then that works. So that was very interesting. The most violent reaction we received from it was New York. It was before there was a great deal of violence in the United States. And now we do it and people no longer take it as being violent because they know perfectly well there might be violence when they go out in the street or even in the seat next to them. My director of photography and I, his name is Makom al Hassan. We met in Armenia in 2006. Um, and since then we pretty much shoot everything together. It took a long time to sort of um, you know, he, he learned a lot about dance and about choreography and um, he taught me a lot about light um, and it's just we have a language that, that works. I think there's so few people know anything about dance and he's one of them and so now we sort of tied into this together because it, we always joke that, you know, it's not a normal movie, you know, it's not like a regular film with actors where... Uh, it is all waiting and all that. I mean, this film was shot in 18 days, you know, 15 days in Germany, two days in France, and one day in New York, which is somewhat impossible. But the amount of uh, storyboarding we've done, uh, because the way we worked, we would pick a location, then we would model it in the architecture program, like a CAD, for instance, and then we'll take that model and we put in the pre-visualization program, uh, previous that would allow you to actually pretty much um, you know, imitate all the shots. Uh, so we would make dances, we'll put the crane in, or steady camera. We can identify the lens. So it was a, like almost an animatic. By the time we got to the shoot, we pretty much knew everything, what's gonna happen. So and because we had so few days, it had to be super disciplined and organized. <laughs> and the, everybody jokes, there's just no, 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 not a second to breathe because that's just how tight it was. But also when you work with the dancers, you know, once they're warm, once they're warmed up, they have to go, they can't wait. Otherwise, you have, they have to warm up again and that takes another hour. And then, you know, the sun left or whatever, you know, there's always something going on. So it's, um, 
it's quite different from a normal movie making process. We considered Cinemascope, uh, but I don't actually remember anymore for what reason it was not selected. We tried all kinds of things. We did a lot of tests. And I think basically the aspect ratio was decided um, was 185, although we shot 177. So um, I don't know. Actually, there's something that I was not so involved with. I had incredible DP and the technical team to sort of take care of all this. In regards to music, so the decision was to try to keep the original music for the dancers. You know, so if it's a John Cage piece, or Martin Feldman, or Nancaro, or David Tudor, or Christian Wolf. We tried to keep them with the original uh, dancers. Just because, you know, uh, Merce is not there to change it. Uh, and also, they're inseparable part of the dance. Although it's funny, because sometimes we had comments like, well, you know, maybe mu John Cage music is too avant-garde, it's very difficult for a film, you know? And I would say, well, you know, maybe Tchaikovsky was very difficult for Swan Lake, you don't take it away, you know? So it's a kind of a, it's a unit. It, this music comes with this dance. However, we had freedom of taking away music, you know, because Merce um, strongly believed that music and dance are separate. You don't have to make dance to music. And, uh, you know, sort of, he always said dance has to stand on its own legs instead of the music. So at times, uh, especially for instance in Winter Branch, um, where half of the dance is in silence, and then Le Mans Le Young music comes, this very, uh, very uh, kind of screechy sound, you know. And because we only took excerpts, not the entire piece, we felt that you know we could actually take away the music and use the environment you know the environment we were in and it so happened when we were filming there was a, a club downstairs I, I thought it was a very John Cage thing like it was kind of a club a train all that you know the all this incredible soundscape so when we were editing it I offered to recreate that you know so that um, you know Merce was very notorious for making events when he would come to a specific location, a place, it can be a square, it can be a museum, it can be a gym, it can be any place, really. He would assess it and then he would pick excerpts from different dancers that would work for this specific location and he'll create a collage basically of his of different from different pieces and then he would either have music or would have no music at all right so he would <clears throat> can ask a new composer to write a piece specifically for what's there or make it on the spot so i felt that creative license that we could actually use the environment as a soundscape but what's interesting was in the club they played some rock music, um, and I did some research on which rock bands John Cage influenced. And one of them happened to be Throbbing Gristle, who is a really great UK band. So I decided, okay, great, that's the Throbbing Gristle will be in the club. So that's how it came about. So there are all these different sort of situations. However, we also had the composer, Hauschke, who is a German composer based in Dusseldorf, um, and his job was to basically kind of, um, you know, develop a through line, you know, especially when the archive come in, um, to sort of bring all this cacophony of music and sound together. So we found uh, this incredible moment when we found the guitar, like as, a, as one of the instruments, and then we sort of went with it. And it created this kind of grounding, a bit of a sense of... Um, you know, like really a through line that tied all these things together. He was a pleasure to work with, and but it was a tall order. I mean, you know, he's entering into this massive celebrity kind of um, avant-garde, uh, you know, canon of people. Um, but I think his music works really well with the film.
I thought that the ballet technique for the legs was astonishing, and I thought many things in the modern dance were remarkable for the torso. To what end this eternal daily struggle? Because inside of all that is an ecstasy. A lot of people say that, you know, it's not the time to talk about arts because we live in such a complex world uh, filled with all kinds of social issues. And unless art addresses them directly, it's really not the time. There are more urgent topics. There's climate change, there's immigration, there's uh, wars, there's all kinds of economic crisis, shortage of water, you know, you, you name it. There's just so much stuff, you know. I'm convinced that, you know, there's never the right time and there's always the right time. So, of course, whenever I was walking around and told people that I would like to make a 3D, 3 million film about American avant-garde choreographer, they were thinking a little bit that I'm either crazy or um, I'm a dreamer. I mean, I'm probably a combination of both of those things. But in the end, I always feel like, you know, presidents, they come and go, Marskaya him and all these artists are going to stay. So I think the hardest thing was to actually make the film happen.